It is my pleasure and honor today to have one of the very eminent speakers and uh, expert. We are very proud that uh, Professor Amr al Hussein Muhammad is uh, uh, our friend and colleague. And uh, all of us are proud by uh, the, your position and your experience that you gained uh, in the CKD, MBD, and the other aspects of nephrology because Professor Amr is now the professor and the medical director of University of Kentucky regarding nephrology aspects and the CKD MBD. So we are very honored and proud by you, Professor Amr. It's Thank time, you, sir. time for you. This is the second session, and we hope to have uh, uh, with you many sessions because your experience is enormous, and you promised me that we will, we will continue as your time allow. So today, this is the second session, for renal ist dystrophy, and this is the management part. Professor Amr. Thank you so much. It's really, I'm really proud, and it's my pleasure to be with you. Um, thank you for this very nice introduction. I don't really deserve it. Um, so last time, if you remember, um, last month, we have uh, the first week of April, we have renal ist dystrophy part one discussion. It was uh, 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 you know, based, based on clinical scenarios of uh, um, a patient. And uh, we discussed intensively how we um, diagnose uh, this patient and we reached the final diagnosis of this patient. Um, this patient uh, was a lady on dialysis and she has a fall and a fracture. Then we just discussed together how can we diagnose her bone problem. Of course, it's a very common problem and we are facing every day. So I'm not going to talk, you know, talk about any um, you know, case, uh, rare case presentation or something. I'm just talking about uh, our practice and the problem that we are facing every day. I'm not going to talk about my disclosure. Today, I'm going to talk about some uh, medications, bone specific medicine, uh, just to let you know I don't get any money or any incentives from any of the bone uh, biomarker companies or pharmaceutical agents. So the discussion today will be mainly, uh, you know, focusing on the basic management of low turnover bone disease and also the advanced management. Advanced management includes both pharmacological and non-pharmacological -pharma intervention. Let us just refresh um, our memories with the patient that we discussed last time because we know uh, the problem she had, but we didn't discuss how to deal with her problem. So uh, she is a 58 year old female. She has type 2 diabetes. She has end stage kidney disease, um, secondary to diabetes, and she uh, is on dialysis for two years. She had a fall in her bathroom and she fractured her. Uh, hip. She had a successful surgery and she came back to our dialysis clinic. Here is her medications. She uh, was on calcium acetate. She was on doxycalciferol, which is, you know, uh, one of the uh, vitamin D analogs or vitamin D receptor agonist, whatever you like to call it. Um, she was on three times hemodialysis. This is her labs. Her serum phosphorus level was 5.6. Her calcium was 9.2. And the albumin 3.2, so the corrected albumin was a little bit over 10. Her BTH was 159. Uh, hemoglobin is 10.4. Alkphos was 108. And we asked what we need to do next for this patient. Uh, is she okay? And we don't have to do any further testing or management or because, you know, she already had, uh, you know, her left hip fracture was fixed and she's back or do we need to do something different? So I think our discussion, we elected to proceed with further testing because Having uh, just a minor fracture, uh, a minor trauma and a fracture is a big deal. It's by definition, this is an osteoporosis. This is a traumatic or low trauma fracture. This is an osteoporosis. 
So we did a DEXA scan for her. And as you see, this is, again, DEXA scan. We discussed what is DEXA scan, what is the pros and cons of DEXA scan. It's a very uh, you know, cost-effective method to examine uh, the quantity of bone, the bone mineral content. But it's, again, it's just two-dimensional. So it gives you uh, the BMD, which is gram by a square centimeter, not cubic centimeter. If you want to do volumetric with 3D, three dimension, you need to do a QCT, a quantitative CT scan. It gives you impression about the volume rather than just the aerial measurement of the bone. You know, to make it simple, the, there is a score. They give you a T score or Z score, and we talked about this T and Z score last time. So let, let's just, you know, stick to the T-score, which is uh, very popular to use. Her T-score was 1.4, that's positive. So that looks very good. So we know that uh, the BMD, if it is more than uh, minus one, that's, you know, considered as normal. Minus one to minus 2.5 is osteopenia. And if the BMD is lower than minus 2.5, that's an osteoporosis. So why? Uh, she fractured with minor trauma despite that she had the normal BMD according to the T-score. We discussed this and uh, um, we elected also to do some qualitative rather than quantitative assessment of her bone because the DEXA scan BMD is only a quantitation, give you the mineral content, the bone mineral content, gram per square centimeter, doesn't give you the quality of the bone. So there is another uh, test that you can get also from the same DEXA scan result. It's called trabecular bone score. And this trabecular bone score gives you a rough estimate about the bone quality. If the, uh, you know, your the result here is in the green, so this means that it's more than 1.4, so that's good. If it's less than 1.2, it's bad. And if it's in between, this is you know, not very bad, not very good. So 1.2 to 1.4 is kind of okay. So here, our patient had a low TBS, so the trabecular bone score was low, and this might indicate that she had a bone quality problem. So we decided to see if she has a bone formation or resorption problem. So we did um, biomarkers. And we said the most commonly used biomarker for dialysis patient is the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase and the TRAB5B, which is tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase. The bone-specific alkaline phosphatase is a marker of bone formation, and the TRAB5B is a marker of bone resorption. So if you want to get an idea about how much the bone is forming and how much the bone is resolving, you need to do biomarker for bone resorption and bone um, formation. There is a lot of biomarker, but uh, several of them are retained in CKD patient, especially with ESRD patient. So in our patient, we use more commonly the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase and the trap 5 p Then uh, the result was low for both. So this means that this patient might have low turnover bone disease, or a dynamic bone disease, so we proceeded and did a bone biopsy. And as you see here, there is no cells, it's acellular, and uh, even there is no osteoid, and the bone volume is low, and there is a lot of adipocytes. So we said there's a trade of the osteoclast and osteoclast by the adipocyte. So this bone is very hypoactive. Some people, they call it dead bone. It doesn't renovate, it doesn't regenerate. So this patient has what we call low bone turnover or a dynamic bone disease with osteoporosis. How to uh, deal with this? First of all, let's just discuss how common is this problem. Let us uh, open the discussion with Mahmoud uh, Sobh and the rest of uh, our trainees. What do you think, uh, Mahmoud? Uh, how common is the low turnover bone disease compared to high turnover bone disease in our uh, dialysis patient. Uh, 
محمود يس اي ثينك هاي تيرن اوفر از مور كومن ذان لو تيرن اوفر اند ادايناميك بون ديزيز سو هاي از مور اند لو از رير وات دو ثينك از ا برسنتج اوف لو تيرن اوفر بون ديزيز ان دايلسيس بيشن I don't give it an estimate. Nowadays, uh, it is increasing, Dr. Um, nowadays, it the, is question, the question is not for you, Dr. Fasim. No, we shared all of us shared together <laughs> because all of us uh, uh, learn from let's you. Let's start. Professor. Yes. Okay, let, let's just start by the Trinis first. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Who, who else want to give uh, some uh, uh, feedback or? 30%? 30%? 30 and high turn. Who is talking? Mahmoud, 30%. Ah, are you still in the... Yeah, Mahmoud, okay, very good. Okay, good. Dr. Ibrahim? To... Dr. Ibrahim? Yes. You promised uh, Saeed, Fadl. Yes, I think... Uh, thank you for all of uh, I think it is increasing as a uh, percentage of end-stage renal disease are common in old age. And... Uh, Which is increasing? Uh, the question... A dynamic bone yeah. disease is more in, 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 more in old age patients than younger patients. Forget about the risk factor now. Just in general, what do you think is high turnover or low turnover bone disease uh, more common in our dialysis patients? No, I think global low turnover because uh, uh, other than the risk factors, the random use of uh, calcium and vitamin. Okay, okay. So, Dr. Hani Mansour. Okay. Dr. Hani. That's, that's very, very, very good answer, by the way. Thank you, Hani. Hani from yes, Saudi. I from yes, Saudi. I think uh, I think low bone turnover is increasing uh, increasing nowadays, especially with the aggressive management of uh, high barbara. So I think it's around maybe twenty five to thirty five percent. So th this is a percentage that you have at the Dallas unit. Uh, yes, yes, and, and most yeah, okay. Uh, okay most uh, monthly lab it's around this. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good, very good answer. Uh, uh, does anybody else want to contribute? Okay, I think we can okay. proceed, Dr. Amr. Yes. Very good, very good. Yes. I think all answers are right. There is, uh, you know, nothing wrong. It just depends on um, the era because there is a paradigm shift. If you're talking about maybe 1980s, um, you know, high turnover. So we start the 1970s with more adynamic bone disease, alum toxicity, because alum was a problem, you know, uh, by that time. Then we moved to high turnover bone disease. Then as um, you know, the uh, listener said, because of overuse of uh, calcium emetics and vitamin D analogs, now we are in the era of low, uh, you know, or uh, dynamic bone disease again. So as you see here, is, this is, by the way, this is from our division. Um, and this is the biggest study that has been done uh, with using bone biopsies for dialysis patients. As you see, 630 dialysis patients had biopsy. This is an, an analysis uh, of over 20 years, uh, you know, uh, of bone biopsies for dialysis patients. As you see here, low turnover bone disease is very high, especially in white. Little bit lower in blacks, but in general, 58% of the dialysis patient in this study, which is the biggest study, had low bone turnover. Only 24 had high turnover, and 18 had normal uh, bone turnover. Again, the biggest study. Let's discuss another study, which is a little bit uh, smaller, came in from Brazil, and they did uh, biopsies for 97 patients. 60% of them had low turnover bone disease, only one third had high turnover bone disease. Very few, by the way, in general, to find dialysis patient with normal turnover. It's either, uh, you know, in one of the extremes of high or low turnover. And more interestingly, as you see here, if you have a BTH less than 150, 82% of this patient had low turnover bone disease. If the BTH was between 150 to 364, so two thirds, uh, around two thirds of this patient, even with a BTH of 150 to 300, had low turnover bone disease. Even keeping the BTH more than 300, you still have one third of patients 
with low turnover from disease. This study, it changed the uh, key DOCI guidelines. So, in, you know, before this study, before 2009, we used to follow the key DOCI guidelines and keeping the BTS between 150 to 300. And based on mainly on this study and some smaller studies, the key DIGO guidelines has been changed and now we are keeping the level between you know, two to nine folds, which is about 150 to 600 or so, just to make sure that um, this patient uh, will not end up by having a dynamic bone disease or lot of copper bone disease. So that's important. So uh, here, this uh, take home message is low turnover bone disease is very common. We are not talking about a rare disease here. You just need to be focused on your patient and see if they really have it or not. But I'm very sure if you go back and check your numbers, and especially if you want to be proactive and to do more tests to see the bone formation and bone resorption, your patient will have, majority of them will have low turnover bone disease. What is the problem with low turnover bone disease? Why do we need the turnover? So our, so our bone has, you know, revolving all the time, it's changing all the time. So all over our life, you change your skeleton every, you know, ar ar around 10 years, you have brand new skeleton. Uh, if you are younger, maybe if you are around 20 or 30 year old, you change your skeleton more often, maybe every five, six, seven years, according to that turnover. If you are older, you slow down the turnover. So there is a, something called remodeling cycle. This remodeling cycle starts by the bone resorption. Why do we need bone resorption? Because bone resorption takes out the old bone and the micro cracks and the unhealthy bone and just degrade this bone through the osteoclast. Then there is another stage called reversal, reversal when the osteoblasts are recruited. And we discussed this last time that osteoblasts, they come in hundreds, they are like soldiers. So they start to, and they work slowly and quietly, and they start to form the bone. So change from reversal to formation phase. And here, instead of this, we call it resorption bed, they filled it because they lay down collagen, which is a matrix of type one collagen, a protein, and then the calcium and phosphorus and carbonate and appetite uh, comes in and fill in uh, this osteoid. So it changes osteoid from unmineralized to mineralized osteoid. And we have normal, healthy, new bone, strong bone than the bad old uh, cracked bone. Then the bone, you know, uh, change to a resting uh, uh, stage, then starts the bone resorption again. So, so for bone formation to happen, you need bone resorption. You cannot form a bone without having bone resorption. So this is very interesting relationship and active process that happen in our bone all the time. So here is the spectrum. We have four spectrum in our dialysis vision from adynamic bone disease, osteomalacia, to Ostitis fibrosa cystica, and sometimes we have mixed batter between high turnover and osteomalacia or uh, a dynamic bone disease. So to keep our patient here in the middle, it's, it's very, you know, uh, tough target because they tend for some reason to either go to the higher extreme or to the lower extreme. So Question for you guys, what is the risk factor? So we know that around 60% or 66% of our dialysis patients uh, have low turnover bone disease, and it's more common nowadays than high turnover bone disease. Uh, so who has higher risk of uh, low turnover bone disease rather than high turnover bone disease? Started by Mahmoud Sob. Mahmoud. Patients overusing uh, calcium uh, supplement and uh, vitamin D. Uh, Very good. Uh, immobility. Good. Uh, who else? Who else wants to add? What is the other risk factors for low turnover bone disease? Old age. 
كراسال ولا What about smoking? Because, uh, so one of the attendees uh, uh, wrote a smoking. That's very... Who, who did that? That's a very smart answer. <laughs> okay. Then mobilization, the malnutrition also. Malnutrition, good, good. Right. Do, Dr. Walid, so, yeah. uh, Dr. Walid uh, wrote smoking, yes. That's very nice. That's very good. There is a good evidence, right, that smoking also decrease the bone formation rate. Welcome to this. So, okay, what is, we all missed the biggest reason of low turnover bone disease. The severest bone turnover disease happened in one occasion. Immobilization. What is that? Immobilization. Immobilization, Immobilization. Uh uh-huh. The severest form. Mohammed Mamdouh. Oh, yes, Mamdouf wrote on this in, in our editorial article. So what is the severest, when is the condition uh, that can cause severe low turnover bone disease, Mamdouf? Uh, I think uh, it is associated with low BTH, maybe. Okay. Yeah, what, what, what when, can when cause we do, low BTH? Maybe hydrogenic? Hydrogenic? me. Right, guys. So... So we do baratheridectomy for the severest of... Yes, right, yes, right. Okay. Thank you. So we do baratheridectomy for the extreme of 
bond turnover, very high turnover bond disease, right? But at the same time, we can just expect, you know, it changes the spectrum of bone disease from very high to very low bone turnover. Here, this is a, a very interesting study that they did a bone biopsy before and after, one year after a uh, barotheridectomy for 19 patients. They divide this patient to all of them, of course, has high turnover bone disease prior to the barotheridectomy. Uh, and 14 of them had cardiovascular calcification, five, they didn't have significant cardiovascular calcification prior to barotheridectomy. Then they followed them up for a year. As you see, 80% uh, of this cohort of patients, they end up in a year with very low bone turnover. Another 10 with low turnover. So overall, 90%, if you add this low to and very low, 90% of this cohort, it changed the bone disease from very high to at least low. And in 80%, it was very low bone turnover. Only 10% had normal. This is why I'm telling you it's hard to just control the disease and um, to be in the normal side rather than to be, uh, you know, by the end of one of these spectrum. More interestingly, they find that patient who had more <laughs> severe low turnover, they had more cardiovascular calcification. So it was, you know, parallel the cardiovascular calcification with the low turnover bone disease. So we have to be careful. And this is another discussion we can talk. Uh, and I, I discussed this before uh, several times. I think, uh, uh, Dr. Hussein, we have um, another teleconference uh, uh, four or five months ago, and uh, his team presented several patients with, um, you know, possibility of low turnover bone disease after parotheridectomy, and we discussed how to uh, deal with these patients. Okay, now let's focus on the basic management of low bone turnover. What do you want to do, guys, for this lady with low bone turnover? What is the initial step, the basic? I don't want any discussion about advanced, you know, management or in intervention here. I'm just talking about basics. What do you want to do for a patient with possibility, at least? I know that, you know, you're, going, you're not going to do a bone biopsy for all of your patients or majority of them. But you see the BTH is, is low, alkaline phosphate is low, calcium is a little bit on the higher side. And if you are, you know, active and you want to do bone formation parameter, you know, or bone resorption biomarker, you can check alkaline phosphate is uh, uh, either the regular one or the bone specific alkaline phosphate is and the tertiary acid phosphate is if you want to check on bone resorption. Then you have an idea that this patient probably have low turnover. For us, we can do bone biopsy, but if it is not available, that's fine. You can just depend on clinical and um, biochemical um, abnormalities. So now you have patient who is most likely um, have low turnover bone disease because we know as nephrologists how to treat high turnover bone disease, right? It's very easy for us. If I ask any of you how to treat it, you have vitamin D, calcium and metrics, blah, blah, blah. But the problem is not all of us are aware by the magnitude of the, pro of the problem of low turnover bone disease and how to deal with it. So what is the basic steps to do for a, a suspect of low, low turnover bone disease? We should stop the risk factor for the low bone turnover. Uh, for example, in our case, uh, the calcium and the vitamin D um, and other uh, previously mentioned risk factor for the bone turnover and reassess. Very good, very good. Anyone want to add anything? Okay, let us see. So here we have, uh, I don't know who said, but uh, what's your name, I'm sorry? Mahmoud. Mahmoud, so. Ah, Mahmoud, okay, thank you, Mahmoud. Okay, so um, we decrease the allergic calcium, so we know that this patient probably have tendency for positive calcium balance. So we try to decrease dialysate calcium. We try to avoid calcium containing uh, phosphate lowering agents to calcium non-containing phosphate lowering agents. So we can change the calcium acetate or carbonate or 
to Sevelamer or Lanthanum or others. Then we stop the vitamin D analogs and the absorption of its own calcium emetics, we hold it, right? This is the basic thing. Okay, the question is, we have to understand the calcium balance in CKD patients, especially in low turnover bone disease patients. The second question is, do we have an evidence supporting this intervention? Do we know if we you know, decrease calcium in dialysis or switch uh, the calcium containing phosphate binders to none or stop the VDREs, is it going to improve the bone health? We are going to discuss that too. And how to follow up. So we do this basic intervention. We do the, you know, um, cut down on calcium uh, intake, cut down on calcium in dialysis, stop the vitamin D analogs, but is it enough or not? We're going to discuss that. So let's talk a little bit about calcium balance because it's a major issue in uh, CKD, especially dialysis patient. As nephrologists, you have to understand the basic concept of calcium balance in our dialysis patients. Um, among several ingredients we have in our body, calcium is one of the major non-gaseous uh, contents of our body. We have our body is formed of 1.5%. So after you know the water, the oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, calcium comes first when it comes to minerals and electrolytes. Uh, phosphate, 1%, potassium, lower, sulfur containing and sodium is lower than the rest, even heavy metals and other you know, rare uh, elements we have in our body. But among all of these, calcium comes first. So uh, how much calcium do we have in our body? So 1.5, if you are 85 kilos, uh, that's, uh, do we have? Do we still have uh, Al Hadidi, Doctor Al Hadidi? Yes, I'm yes. Or, okay, yes. Al Hadidi. So 1.5 percent. How how much? How many kilos? Uh, your weight? Uh, I weigh about 72 kilograms. 72. Yes. So what is 1.5 percent of 72? Around maybe one kilo. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's, it's, it's a math test today. Okay, <laughs> so you're about one kilo. Mine may be a little bit higher or Dr. Hussein a little bit higher. Maybe one to 1.5 kilogram. We are talking about kilograms <laughs> here of, of uh, calcium in our body. Where does this exist? 99% of this exists in the bone. Only 1% is intracellular and very, very few fraction, 0.1% is extracellular. The problem is this extracellular calcium concentration is a biologically active calcium and it control everything else. So when you check, this is very important, and I want you to understand this concept. When you check the serum calcium level, what are you checking? Are you checking the intracellular or the bone compartment of, of the calcium? Definitely not. You're just checking the extracellular calcium concentration. And this extracellular calcium con concentration, not all of, of this is biologically active. So only 50% is ionized calcium and the rest are either bound to the albumin, different protein, or in a complex form, okay? So when it comes to calcium balance, even if you see your CKD patient or ESRD patient have normal serum calcium or low or high, it doesn't do anything with the calcium balance. The patient can have severe positive calcium balance and severe cardiovascular calcification, despite that the serum calcium level is low because we are only checking 0.1. So that's one out of a thousand, right? and the rest are mainly in the bone, 99 and 1% in the interstitial. This 1% of interstitial is very, we cannot live, you know, 
without this 1% interferon because it control all the musculoskeletal and cardiomyocytes and uh, the um, you know, uh, CNS and peripheral nervous system action. Any disturbance of this level can have a fatal consequences. So uh, let us start with uh, who, who wants to uh, be with me with the calcium balance, who wants to learn more or to discuss this more. So, okay, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Al Hadidi can continue with you, Dr. Amr, in Dr. this Hadidi, part. You should be uh, breaking your fast now. <laughs> So uh, well, after, the, after, after, the, after Kelsam, listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. So you should be hungry when you see this picture. Okay, it's so only me and the him are fasting. You, you, you guys are already are eating and uh, you know, have, having fun. Okay. So what is your, what is your or my average calcium intake, the daily calcium intake? Um. I think it's about three grams per day. Um, yeah, it's about one gram. So it depends on several factors, but in general, it's about one, 1 1.2 uh, gram a day. Okay. Yeah. What happened to this calcium intake? Say, just to make it simple, say one gram, that's 1,000 milligram. What happened to this? So when it, it goes first to the gut, right? Yeah. Okay, what happened to this? How much do you absorb from this calcium and how much do you excrete in the feces? Uh, in, well, general. Think, in general, I think that about 70% is absorbed. 70% uh, absorbed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else has different opinion? Dr. Hani Mansour, Dr. Amr, about this now. Dr. Hani. Yes, uh, I think if the average intake will be around 1,000 milligram, it will end by 800 milligram will be excreted in stool and the 200 in urine. And there's a continuous process of bone formation and resorbing almost zero balance. Wow, that's very good. <laughs> that's very good. I don't have to explain this anymore. I can just go to the next slide. Very good. So, yeah, it's very close. I mean, it depends on several factors. Again, it depends on your calcium balance, on your BTH, on your vitamin D level. Of course, if you need more calcium, you absorb more. If you have more calcium in your system, you absorb less. But in general, yeah, you know, 15 to 25, just to make it simple, as Hani said, just say 200 will be absorb it, and the rest, 800 milligram, will be excreted directly to the uh, stool. So we don't utilize uh, these. It, just make it, to make it easy, just remember, when you have patient with hypercalcemia, do we give a calcium binders that work on the gut? Dr. Hani. No. no. Definitely not. But if you have hyperphosphatemia, what is the first response after controlling the diet is to give phosphate binders. binders that work on the gut because phosphate actually absorbed about 80%, 85% in the gut, but only 15, 20, or maximum 25% of the calcium is absorbed in the gut. So you want to work. So when it comes to hypercalcemia, we like to work on the kidney because the kidney secretes the majority and the gut doesn't have very good rule because it absorbs only 20%. But when it comes to hyperphosphatemia, we don't treat hyperphosphatemia by anything works on the kidney, right? We work mainly on the gut that because is. the majority, the majority uh, is absorbed in the gut. So it's very important to you know understand this concept and how we because it's going to impact how we treat and how you know the consequences of this problem. Okay, so say I, I will stay with with Hani, and well, he said 200 will be absorbed to in the blood. So what will happen to this 200? Uh, yes, in the in the kidney, uh, uh, about 60 to 70 percent will be absorbed by the in the proximal tubule. 
60 percent uh, will be absorbed so just we stick to 200 so you mean 120 milligram will be absorbed reabsorbed you mean yes re reabsorbed yes in the proximal tubule 120 and uh, the rest 20 percent uh, around 20 percent in the thick ascending and uh, in the distal uh, tubule, maybe 10% collecting duct 5%. Wow, are you reading from somewhere? <laughs> That's very good. So, uh, yeah, very close. So the majority of this calcium will be excreted actually in the urine. What's our average calcium excretion, daily calcium excretion in urine? Uh, any want, uh, anybody else wants to contribute? What's our daily calcium excretion? Don't know. <laughs> okay. How do you uh, diagnose hypocalciuria or hypercalciuria? I can answer that. Um, okay. Don't about... open Google. Don't yeah. ask Mr. Google, okay? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, okay about, sure. it's about from um, 100 to 150 milligrams per day, the, the urinary excretion of sodium calcium. Very good. Yeah, very close. Again, so hypercalciuria, the definition is, we say in, in men, it's different from men and, uh, and women, and it's also different by age. So simply you can say four milligram per kilogram in, in, in women and five milligram per kilogram in men, or you can say 250 in women and 300 uh, milligram um, uh, in, in men. This is the hyper, how you diagnose hypercalciuria. Anyway, but yeah, on average, we excrete about 150 milligram uh, uh, of calcium in our urine daily. So go back here, we absorb it 200 milligram. We excreted here about maybe 150, 160, 170. Then uh, there is another endogenous excretion from the blood to the stool of calcium, you know, very small fraction, maybe another 10 milligram or so. And the rest, only small, very small fraction. It depends on, again, your turnover. Do you need more calcium? Do you have more bone formation? You'll utilize more calcium or not? So if you are active, if you're young, you will probably, uh, your you know, skeleton will take maybe around 10 milligram a day or so of this calcium to build up the skeleton. I mean, then we are reaching a steady state, then um, after time we can lose more than we, whatever we, we get. But the bone, only a very small fraction. You remember bone has 99%. But the rest is either excreted in the colon or excreted in the urine. And 99% of the small fraction of the 10 milligram or so uh, will go to the bone and the rest will stay, the 1% will be distributed between intercellular and extracellular. Very good, this is a very nice study. They did, they give uh, radioactive calcium, the 45, and they trace the calcium excretion in the gut, in the urine, and uh, in the bone to see how much we utilize from each. Just to make it simple, if we have an end-stage kidney disease who doesn't make urine, so this, whatever, the 150 milligram is not going to be excreted in the urine. At the same time, if this patient has a dynamic bone disease, he doesn't utilize the calcium. So there is no calcium influx to the bone. At the same time, if the patient has high turnover bone disease, there is more calcium efflux coming out from the bone. And this goes to the extracellular. So this daily, we said daily we excrete about you know, 150, 160, 170 milligram uh, of um, the calcium. Now we cannot utilize, bone cannot utilize calcium. Urine, um, there is the urinary calcium excretion is very low. So what happened with the extracellular uh, fluid calcium. We don't see that our patient have very high serum calcium. So the calcium goes somewhere, especially if the BTH is low. So the BTH tries to keep the uh, calcium inside the blood vessel. If the BTH is low, what will happen? And even if it's high, but just focus here because of our the fit, the, the you know uh, our discussion. So we are focusing on low low turnover or adynamic bone disease. So the rest of the calcium will go to the intravascular uh, space, will go to the cardiovascular system, which can cause 
calcification, cardiovascular calcification. Dr. Samah, so, uh, Dr. Samah already wrote vascular calcification, so uh, it's a good, good. good answer, yes. Very good, thank you. So it's, it's, it's a major risk, especially if you have low or uh, high turnover bone disease, you are either not utilizing calcium or calcium, the, the efflux will be higher and both can be associated with increased cardiovascular calcification and mortality. Very nice study, guys. I mean, I just want you to focus on this study that was published in Kidney International uh, 2012, okay, not very long time ago. This study was published just for six CKD patients and other six control, okay? So the total is 12 patients. What they did, they did calcium balance study for this. It's not like they are doing innovation or something like, you know, going to the moon. It's very easy. It's not, you know, very costly. You can do it if you're doing thesis for master's thesis or, uh, you know, the uh, VHD or, or doctoral thesis, whatever. Very easy. And this was very publishable. So they did calcium balance, just six patients. They didn't do uh, 600 patients, six, six patients. And they cross over these patients. So they put them on either low calcium intake, 800 milligrams a day, or high calcium intake, two grams a day. And they cross over. So they put them on uh, nine days, either on low, then they give a washout period, then they switch low to high and high to low. And they examined the calcium balance for this patient. How to examine the calcium balance for this patient? This is not radioactive, or this is just very simple. This is a patient, six patient with CKD stage three and four, and another six patient, and they gave them controlled diet. So they know what, uh, what is the content of calcium in their diet. Uh, I need, Anyone can explain to me how can we check the calcium balance in general for our patients? Why this particular study is very interesting and it was published in Kidney International and it was only done for six patients and six control and only nine days, nine days and wash out periods. You can finish the whole thing in 30 days or less and you get, you know, get it published in, in very good journal. Why it's interesting to do that? What do you think, Mamdouh? Mamdouh knows the answer. Anyone, anyone want to uh, give his uh, intake on this? Well, I, I think that, that uh, uh, proper measuring of the calcium balance is by measuring the, the serum calcium, serum albumin, and uh, the intact PTH and to detect whether the patient is receiving uh, what, what kind of calcium in his diet. Is his diet is rich in calcium or low in calcium? And measure also the 24-hour urinary calcium excretion. By, by this means, we, we can exactly detect how, how the calcium uh, is disbalanced. Oh, okay, so the calcium intake and the urinary calcium excretion, and you said the serum and the you know, corrected calcium with albumin and BTH. And BTH, yes. Right, okay. Anybody else want to add? Uh, we already discussed this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I think. Okay, keep keep Mamdouh till the end. Who, who wants to give his uh, intake on this? And serum phosphorus as well. Okay. I think uh, there, uh -huh. there was there was some some ideas before to check the in in calcification, like in the aorta and the, in the major blood vessels. Okay, very good. So Mamdouh, do you want to say it? We discussed it with Mamdouh the other day, so he knows it. Mamdouh. What is, is to do like 24 hour stool calcium? So. Right. You guys forget the major contributor here is the stool. So the stool, if you are taking two grams uh, a day of uh, calcium, the stool will have, if you say, 80% of this, it would be more because when you put them on positive calcium balance, you will start to get rid of this and the stool will have more than 80%, maybe 85 will go straight to the stool. So you need, so the, the difficult part in this kind of calcium balance study 
is you need to collect the stool for 24 hours, not only the yarn. Oh. And it's kind of offensive, right? So anyway, so this is the reason. But if you're interested, you can repeat this. I, I, I really encourage Dr. Hasim and Dr. Adam and uh, the rest of uh, uh, well, the well, we have Dr. Magd Shirkawa as well and Professor Saeed Khamis. So a lot oh, of nice. guests today. Yeah. Very, very, very good. So I really encourage all of you guys to give such simple thing, you know. Uh, it's just an experiment that you can do. And it's easy, I think, um, apart from collecting the, the stool for 24 hours. Anyway, so what happened to these patients? We have two groups of patients. We have control and we have CKD patient and they put them either on low or on high calcium intake. So that here let's focus on the healthy people, the controlled people here. So if you put them in low calcium balance and low calcium intake, the calcium balance is going down. If you put them in a higher calcium intake, they are positive. They have positive calcium balance about maybe 400 milligram a day, okay? It's just this. This was, uh, you know, studied just for nine days. It might be unethical to do this for a long time because you'll be uh, having more and more calcium, um, you know, balance uh, on the higher calcium balance here or low calcium balance here. Anyway, let's focus on the uh, our patient CKD. What happened with them? If you put them in a low um, calcium uh, intake, their calcium balance is a little bit lower, but it's not too bad. It's not terrible. See that. Okay, maybe less than 50 milligram negative balance a day, okay? And if you bought them on a high uh, calcium Do Dr. intake... Amr. Yes, sir. Dr. Amr, uh, uh, Professor Magdi Sharkawi uh, raised uh, raise, uh, his hand just to deliver a comment. So okay, a, very good. Professor Magdi. Welcome, sir. Uh, just a, a second. Okay, let me... Keep going till he will uh, uh, talk. Yeah, and he, is, he is with us, Dr. Ram. Dr. Magdi. Dr. Ram, yes. Yes. I, I dislike this study, Dr. Amr. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because of the, the, the methodology, the stool collection uh, for 24 hours only is not enough to measure uh, calcium balance. What else do you need, sir? <laughs> yes, I, I need to, to do it for at least two to three days, which will be cumbersome for the patient. Right, they did, it, they did it twice. They did it for twice. 48 hours, right. Uh, yes. you right. Know it, I agree. Uh, calcium also is a constipating agent. So oh. some patients, when they are constipated, they will not pass the calcium in the stools. It's smart, all, smart all, 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 as usual, right. Although, although the idea is, is tempting, that right. calcium, uh, calcium in CKD patient, it does not accumulate that much. It has nothing to do with the serum calcium. That's this right. Is, there, is, there is no uh, correlation uh, between calcium our, balance right, yeah. and the serum calcium, right? Yeah, but, but they clearly both, that uh, uh, stools is a major uh, excreting uh, organ for calcium. Thank you, sir. It's, uh, so if, they, you, if, if anyone you can, need to repeat it, you, you, you need to do it for several days. Uh, I think so it, so uh, here is very they, difficult. They did this for nine, for nine days. Then they collect the stool for and the urine, they repeat it twice. So they did 48 uh, you know, hour collection for two days. But they did the, the, the you know, diet, controlled the diet for nine days. Anyway, you, you, can, you can also do this. I, I think it's, it's uh, very publishable, it's very nice. And very few studies uh, was published on the calcium balance, especially when it comes to the CKD. You can do it also for end stage kidney disease patient or you know BD or hemodialysis. Then you have just five or ten patients from each. It will be very nice study. Anyway, so but as 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 Dr. Magdi said, so the calcium and phosphorus level hasn't been changed. Okay, only the patient had positive calcium balance. It doesn't didn't touch the serum uh, calcium level or serum phosphate levels. Okay, so again, this is just to emphasize that our patient could be on a high or very high calcium, positive calcium balance, despite that the serum calcium and serum phosphorus uh, hasn't been changed. Perfect. So uh, let us talk about if we have evidence. So the, the, the first question we, we, we talked about is uh, the calcium homeostasis and calcium balance. And I think it's a very important concept to understand. 
And the second thing, do we have an evidence supporting if we cut down on calcium or vitamin D analogs or you know, dialysate calcium or calcium containing phosphate binders? Is it going to help our bone? Is it going to help the low turnover bone disease? I'm focusing here on bone, not on the cardiovascular calcification, uh, because it might be another discussion. And I'm very sure that you have several uh, webinars about the cardiovascular calcification risk and situation. But here I'm just focusing on whatever I understand more is the bone part and the renal osteo restoration. So this is a very simple study. It was done on BD patient. They just random the patient either to a low or high uh, calcium dialysis. So 3.25 or 2 milli equivalent per liter of um, calcium in dialysis. And they followed uh, these patients for 60 weeks. So more than a year. That's a very good study. And you see here patients who uh, were on um, lower calcium bath, they have higher BTH levels. So the BTH went up about two to three folds. And the bone formation, so they did bone biopsy before and after, you know, this uh, 60 weeks of either low calcium or high calcium dialysis. And as you see here, bone formation rate went up significantly in the uh, lower um, calcium group. So it's very important. If you put the patient on a higher, higher calcium bath, probably this can hurt his bone formation rate, and this might induce um, low turnover bone disease, especially in BD patient, as we discussed. Okay, does this only happen to the BD patient? It happens also to the hemodialysis Dr. Amr. patient. Dr. Amr. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. We have a question from Dr. Tariq Tantawi asking about to what extent to reduce dialysate calcium. Which is the yeah, very, very, very good question. Yes. If you go to the, uh, just to stick to the guidelines, KDGO guidelines said 2.5 to 3. That's for me is still high. For me, I like to use 2.25 for, especially for hemodialysis vision. Milli equivalent. It depends on, uh, I'm sorry? Milli equivalent. Right. right. Yes. So here, here I, I'll go back to this study, the BD vision, because we know that BD vision have more a chance of having low uh, or you know low turnover bone disease or a dynamic bone disease so they compared just 3.25 and 2.0 milli equivalent per liter of uh, calcium dialysis in hemodialysis here your see the study is, is going to use higher calcium concentration uh, in the dialysis so here they use 1.25 uh, millimole is 2.5 Milli equivalent, right? So they use either 2.5 or 3.5, so a little bit higher, okay? And they compared this, they did a calcium coronary artery calcification score and they did bone biopsies before and after. And as you see, patient here on the 2.5 uh, milli equivalent per liter or 1.25 milli more per liter, whatever you like to, to call it, um, they had lower, you know, progression of their CACs, of their coronary artery calcification. And especially this having seen the difference, if the patient has a phosphorus level of more than 4.7, they found that higher calcium concentrations in the dialysis in two years uh, follow-up study, they will have very positive uh, you know, coronary artery calcification score will go higher. And here is a bone uh, histomorphometry analysis. I, I, I don't want to go over this, but of course, patients with higher calcium dialysis, they end up by having more uh, low turnover bone disease or adynamic bone disease. So 2.5, I think it's, it's, it's good. 2.25, I, you know, regularly, especially if I, you know, it's, you have to tailor this. So if the patient have possibility of high turnover bone disease, 2.5, 2.75, uh, you know, milli equivalent per liter is fine. If the patient has low turnover bone disease, I think we need to bought them maybe on 2.25. If the patient has hypercalcemia and the, you, you know, increased coronary artery calcification, I think we might think in doing two, which is, might be very low. Not every nephrologist will accept that. 
cardiologist probably will not also be happy with that, but at least 2.25 or, or 2.5 should be fine. Again, mainly equivalent beer DCV. Okay, very good. Okay, so we discussed this. So there is an evidence that if we cut down on the uh, dialysate calcium, this might improve the cardiovascular calcification, and this might also improve uh, the bone formation rate. What about calcium containing versus you know, non-calcium containing phosphate lowering agent? Data here are not consistent. There is differences between studies and they are all small studies that uh, the biggest study either didn't um, you know, compare. So there's a, a study was published to, to 2012 by Jeffrey Block and he just uh, realized that all patients who received phosphate binders, either non-calcium containing or calcium containing phosphate binder, they progressed their coronary artery calcification compared to people who received placebo. This was very interesting. But anyway, other studies you know, showed either no difference or there is a significant difference toward less cardiovascular calcification and less uh, you know, uh, a dynamic bone disease on patients who are receiving non-calcium containing uh, phosphate binders. So this is a nice study, was done over uh, 100 uh, patients, and they followed these patients for 54 weeks, so a little bit, uh, you know, about a year or, or more. And as you see here, patients who were on non-calcium containing phosphate binder, binders, they have better BTH level, and Sevelamere improved the bone formation uh, rate and therapeutic architecture compared to the calcium containing phosphate binders. However, th there was no statistical significance uh, for the bone turnover or mineralization, but only bone formation improved if you um, give these patients non calcium containing uh, lowering agents. What about vitamin D analogs? Uh, this study actually came in also from uh, our uh, division uh, many, many years ago. It was published in 1989. Very interesting study, by the way, and one uh, of the pillars for using uh, uh, the 125 vitamin Ds and CKD patients prior to dialysis. And they did uh, a prospective double-blinded uh, trial, and it was short-term, just on 16 patients. Again, um, just talking about very small studies when it comes to CKD patients with good quality study and double blinded study, just eight patients in each group. So they give either placebo for eight patients or uh, calcitriol for another eight patients with CKD stage three and four. And calcitriol actually decreased bone turnover and it used a dynamic bone disease in 80% of patients. So we have uh, based on this, uh, you know, a very good study and other studies, yes, there is a good possibility that if you oversuppress uh, the BTH, you can oversuppress the bone turnover and induce a dynamic bone disease in good portion of our patient. So we discussed that decreasing dialysate calcium might be helpful. Changing uh, the phosphate lowering agent from calcium containing to non-calcium containing might be helpful, and Stopping the uh, vitamin D analogs also might be helpful. Okay, so we have done this to our patients, okay? You remember our nice patient, the dialysis patient, she's diabetic, she was on dialysis for two years, and she fractured her hip with minor or uh, minor trauma or probably uh, no trauma. She just slept in her bathroom. And after six months of doing this, calcium went down from 9.2 eight to 9.2. Phosphorus level went a uh, little bit down from 5.6 to uh, 5.4. IBTH increased from 159 to 187. Alkphos uh, from 108 to 110. And now, because I talk too much, so uh, what do you want to do Next, and let's open the discussion if you want, if anybody wants to contribute um, and tell me what clinically you're going to do. I, I think you are facing this problem you know, almost every day in your dialysis patient. 
and uh, if you have such patient who had a fracture and uh, was a little bit on the positive calcium balance and you cut down on the calcium uh, dialysate and the dialysate and you switch the um, phosphate binder to non-calcium uh, containing phosphate uh, lowering agents and you stop vitamin D analogs. Then six months, you see this change, you know, mild improvement in the serum calcium and phosphorus and BTH and alpha phosphorus. What do you want to do next? So we have here two answers. Uh, further okay. testing, start the cynical set. And if Dr. Hani Mansour wants to add anything, Hani? Uh, y- yes. Uh, I, I think we initially depend on the uh, qualitative method to assess her bone status. So uh, among the results seen in follow-up, we have only lab results. We don't have a comparison of the qualitative uh, bone she has. We started management earlier, depending on the qualitative assessment of her bone status. What, what do you but, want to do next, uh, Hani? The choice, Hani. Your choice from these five choices. I think you need the further assessment because later she may need the like teriberitide or, or anything. That's very good. That's a very smart answer. So what test do you want to do? Annie? Uh, yeah, I think we need to, uh, it seems it will be difficult, but it seems to uh, to assess the quality of the bone as, as, uh, uh, as uh, a, you, you it's mentioned. It's a smart answer, but just try to be more specific. What exam do you want to do? Are you going to prescribe bone quality study and just send the patient and you know, write on a paper, just do a bone quality study or you're going to ask for a specific test? We will do uh, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase and uh, we'll do the specific form of uh, uh, MRI as, as so, we saw in the previous uh, lecture. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Hani. Uh, here we have uh, multiple answers. That's, this that's is a very good answer. I, I, I like Hani's answer, and by the way, very smart. Okay. Uh, so we have here multiple answers biphosphonate, denizumab, trabecular bone score assessment, bone biopsy, biopsy. So a lot okay. of choices, yes. Okay, that's, so this means that we don't have consensus as nephrologists. We don't know exactly how to deal with this species. So, you know, despite that, it's a very common scenario. It's very common, you know, daily practice, but we don't have, you know, consistency how to treat this patient, right? So it's better to understand and to discuss. And I think this is one of the major advantage of these webinars that we can discuss together how can we deal with our patient and hopefully this will positively impact our patient health. Okay, so let's discuss number one. Number one is nothing, she is doing fine and all her numbers look stable. As I said, and Dr. Uh, Magdi uh, said, so even if it doesn't mean that her calcium, serum calcium is normal, her serum phosphorus is normal, it doesn't mean that she has normal bone turnover or normal uh, calcium or phosphate balance. Definitely, we diagnosed her, you know, with the gold standard, where, you know, intervention with bone biopsy, and she had low turnover bone disease. Uh, BTH didn't improve much. Calcium phosphorus is not a very good marker to start with. Alkaline phosphatase, the the regular alkaline phosphatase, the total one didn't improve from 108 to 110. So she still have good possibility that her bone disease and her cardiovascular calcification didn't uh, improve Uh, a lot with this intervention. So I think we need to do something more than that. Otherwise, she will come again with fracture or she will accumulate more calcium and and phosphorus and minerals in her cardiovascular system and she might die from uh, cardiovascular calcification problem. Start bisphosphonates, I don't think it's a good answer. For this patient has low turnover bone disease, bisphosphonates definitely is going to induce more low turnover bone disease because it basically it kills, it increases the apoptosis of the osteoclast. So it decreases the bone uh, turnover because it decreases the bone resorption. And when you decrease bone resorption, you also decrease bone formation because there is no trigger for the bone formation. Start cynical set probably is going to the same to do the same thing. Her BTH to start with is not too high. I mean her BTH as we discussed here 
was 159 six months ago, and now it's 187 still on the lower side, especially when you look to the elk force still on the lower side as well. Start calcitonin, definitely not. And the calcitonin, again, it's anti-resorbative therapy. It's not very proven, especially in CKD patients. And uh, we, we stopped using calcitonin for, you know, several uh, decades now. So there is no data um, suggesting use of calcitonin for our CKD patients at least. Uh, so I think it makes sense to do, you know, other testing. And what is the other testing that we need uh, to do? So as Hany said, we did bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. So bone-specific alkaline didn't change much. So bone formation rate didn't change. So still this patient have probably still have low turnover bone disease. Uh, TRAP5B, which is a bone resorption marker, also it actually went down a little bit. So the bone resorption didn't improve as well. This is, uh, I discussed this with Dr. Uh, Magdi last time, and I just want to insist on the value of, uh, you know, using um, both the total alkaline phosphatase, as he suggested, and the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase as biomarkers for bone formation rate. So you have the BTH, which is, you know, can give you impression about the turnover, the bone resorption, then you can use the total alkaline phosphatase or much better to use the uh, bone-specific alkaline phosphatase to give you an impression uh, uh, about what's going on in your bone. So here, the, so the bone alkaline Excuse bone me, Dr. Am. Yes, sir. Dr. Dr. Magdi, yes. You want to add something, Dr. Magdi? Uh, uh, thank you for, for the presentation. I have a concern about uh, defining this patient low turnover without bone biopsy. We did, sir. We did. It was you did biopsy? On... Yes. Ah, this is the that's, same. That's, that's why, because I, I catch you after half an hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but if, if, you, if you face the lab work without bone biopsy, you might consider bisphosphonate, particularly in this patient, because she is diabetic. And diabetics have diabetic bone disease also. And she is a lady with diabetes, CKD. If you don't take bi bone biopsy and you are not going to, to do it, I don't see why not you try biphosphonate for some time, especially donuzumab. You can use it, donuzumab, and we have an chance to have a study with bisphosphonate. It was published two years ago in Hemodels uh, uh, International by Professor Muhammad Ali Ibrahim. And he got the best abstract in the, in the conference because he, uh, admi uh, he treated 30 patients, not six or nine. And there was an improvement in symptoms rather than the bone quality, which is good for the patient. And the BTH was and in this, was the same range? with high turnover bone disease? No, they, 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 all of them have normal BTH. The, the, uh, it's difficult to accept this, Dr. Magdi. I think this is I, I, I will forward the abstract. It yeah, it's okay. The, yeah. It is okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bisphosphonate yeah. was, uh, for my mind, um, because Dr. Amro will correct me, uh, the, for my mind, bisphosphonate was contraindicated in the Alice patient since a long time. And then the door is open for wise use of uh, bisphosphonate if we have uh, BTH that allow us to use. I think if BTH is, low, is normal, or lower than normal, it is difficult. It's not normal. It is the accepted range. It is within the accepted range. No more than 500. And the serial was uh, was declining or was static? We wasn't targeting the PTH. We was targeting okay. the bone quality and the symptoms for the patient. OK. We will, we'll very, very good. Very, yes. very stimulative discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. very, very good. Thank you. Yes, I mean, uh, this was for needs has limitation, but at least you have to make sure that this patient doesn't have a dynamic or low turnover bone disease before so using I, it. I, I miss that you take a biopsy. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> so, okay. yeah. so uh, again, so let, let's go back to the use. We can talk about this for needs later on. Let's just focus here on the biomarkers. So uh, again, biomarkers, um, bonus specific alkaline phosphatase is very, you know, 100% sensitive. This is not something uh, new. This is you know, over uh, two decades ago. Uh, so the use of uh, BSB is, is very helpful to, for bone formation. And also, if you want to use just regular, if you don't have this, but I'm very positive if you, if you start to order this 
And if you are more oriented on the, you know, about it and start to use it, the labs will, uh, will uh, afford it. So if you use the uh, regular alkaline phosphatase, still you have you know, good numbers here, but when it comes to the positive predictive value, it's, uh, it's very low, uh, um, especially for low turnover bone disease. It's, it's much better for high turnover bone disease, uh, but not for uh, you know, low turnover bone disease. So just to go back here, I will show you something. If you have a BSB, which is a bonus of alkaline phosphatase, more than 20, and BTH, especially if the BTH is more than 200, this excludes a dynamic bone disease according to this study. It's very important. So it's non-invasive. I know that bone biopsies, especially if you don't do bone biopsies in Egypt, so just you can use this non-invasive biomarkers. It's very helpful. So if the level is, is more than 20, that patient probably doesn't have low turnover bone disease. Back to our patient, the level was eight, increased after six months to nine, still very low. So if the level is less than 20, there's good possibility that the patient has a dynamic bone disease, even without doing the bone biopsy. Is this enough? Is this enough after six months of lowering the calcium, um, you know, in the dialysis and ch switching calcium containing to non calcium containing uh, phosphate binders, or is it better use the term phosphate lowering agents now? And you stop the vitamin D analogs. But as you see here, the parameter didn't in, you know, improve much. The BTH still on the lower side, the um, you know, bone resorption and bone formation marker didn't improve very much. So we need to control the bone disease just to find the balance. We need to find the balance. Maybe even a little bit low or a little bit high is OK, but at least we don't like extremes. Try to bring this patient to the mainstream, to around the normal. I, I, I don't say normal, exactly normal, because it's very hard to achieve in CKD patients, but at least toward the normal balance. So I think this is not, and if you don't do anything for her, she might have another bone loss and uh, you know, bone quality and bone quality, quantity and quality problems, and also increased cardiovascular circulation. So, uh, as we discussed, as Dr. Magdi said, we, we have two wings, we have two arms, the anti-resorbative therapies like bisphosphonate, denosumab, which is monoclonal antibody to the rank L, uh, the selective estrogen receptor modulators, then the calcetone. And these are anti-resorbative agents. We are just using this patient for these agents for patients with high turnover bone disease with high resorption, but this patient doesn't have high bone resorption to start with. Her problem is low bone formation. So it's better to give her something that can improve her bone formation. We call it osteoanabolic agent or osteobuilders. So periparatide, abaloparatide, bromosusumab, we'll discuss it. It's not you know, utilized in CKD patients, but it can be for non-CKD patients. But mainly you can treat this with bone builders, with osteoanabolics, okay, rather than the anti-resorptive medication, as Dr. Hassin said. Very good. So do we have evidence that teribaratide or apalobaratide is good for our CKD patients? This is a very simple, uh, you know, uh, study was published. They just did bone biopsy before and, and after using 24 months of teribaratide. And this is a 3D micro CT. So this is a bone biopsy and the process this bone biopsy under the micro CT, very small slices. And as you see here, both see here that terabicular are very thin, it's rod-like, and here it's a blade-like, so it's more thick. Connectivity, they are connected. Here, there is this connection of the terabicular and also the thickness of the cortex, the compact bone here is better, and the porosity, so here it's more porous here, so the porosity here is um, uh, better. Here is, um, you know, meta-analysis was done for use of uh, teriperitide for uh, dialysis patient. Many studies, mainly small studies, that have shown either improvement of uh, bone turnover parameters or BMDs, uh, uh, bone mineral density by DEXA scan, and few uh, dead biopsies. And let's just discuss uh, the few that did before and, and after biopsy. 
Uh, another interesting thing, because uh, uh, teriveratide is daily injection, okay? It's 20 um, uh, units injection, 20 microgram uh, injection subcute daily. And it's kind of troublesome, especially for vision, you know, the convalescence and the pain and, all, you know, already our visions are suffering on dialysis. They don't need more injections, especially if they, if they are diabetic or taking insulin. You add another subcute injection, it's troublesome for them. So this study just used another weekly um, dose of the teriberitide and the ex you know, followed this up for uh, 48 uh, weeks, or close to one year for 22 patients. And as you see here, the patient who received teriberitide, there was significant improvement in the lumbar spine, uh, BMD, and also with the bone formation rate. However, it didn't improve the femoral uh, neck BMD or the radius you know, uh, BMD, but it was good for the vertebral uh, BMD and biomarkers. Another study that was also done on the weekly teriberitide. So, it's, uh, so these studies actually came in from Japan and they are using this weekly uh, 56.5 mics uh, injections of the teriberitide and they published several articles on that. This is another one. Also, this is um, a randomized controlled trial on 15 patient uh, dialysis patient with low BTH, BTS less than 60. And uh, uh, what they found is also there was improvement on the teriberitide uh, group uh, regarding their uh, lumbar spine uh, BMD. So it looks like it's very good, especially for the vertebrae. Bone formation markers uh, improved, but bone resorption marker didn't change. And this is very anticipated. You give this to improve bone formation mainly. So let's just go. I, I know that uh, you need to do stuff and salat tarawih, and I don't want to keep you longer here. So another thing we can use also for our dialysis patients is abalobaratide. This abalobaratide is a BTHRB that was uh, approved by FDA uh, three, four years ago. And now uh, this, is, this was based on this study, very interesting study called active trial. So what they did, there was three arm and all the three arms uh, were blinded. So they give one arm, which uh, they give the placebo for patient with osteoporotic woman, uh, um, monobosal osteoporotic woman. And this was uh, RCT, randomized clinical trial, three arms. One, they give a balobaratide. One, they give teribaratide. And the third arm, they give placebo. Just imagine, they give placebo, which is injection, placebo, nothing. They are giving, you know, water or whatever. They are, you know, giving injection. Uh, daily of abalobaratide for over 800 patients just to examine the effect. And this was for one and a half year to keep a patient on daily injections of placebo, which is nothing, for 18 months. And this patient already have osteoporosis. I mean, again, this is, you can talk about, uh, you know, the ethics here that uh, Dr. Shaisha was talking uh, about uh, earlier this meeting. But anyway, one of the biggest study, more than 5,000, and they um, randomized more than 800 in each arm. And as you see here, abalobaratide wasn't inferior to teribaratide, actually was a little bit better when it comes to the head uh, BMD, uh, femoral neck BMD, and lumbar spine BMD. Also, the fractures were lower compared, much lower compared to the placebo. You can say maybe just a fracture is in tibia or fibula or radius or arna, but they also did the major osteoporotic fractures in the vertebrae or the um, you know, neck of the femur. And also the placebo group had much higher fracture rate over the two years period compared to teribaratide and apalobaratide. So apalobaratide here had the lowest uh, fracture rate. Very interesting. And also you can see here the uh, VINB and the CTX is another biomarker we don't usually use in CKD vision because they are relatively retained in CKD vision. As we discussed, we use the bone specific alkaline phosphatase and TRAP 5B, but also the teriberitide improves the bone formation biomarker and bone resorption biomarker. So the CTX is bone resorption marker and VINB is a bone formation marker, both improved better with the teriberitide. So teriberitide is. Uh, you know, very promising agent. So you can ask me why you're talking about osteoporotic women, you know, and they don't have CKD. So they did post hoc analysis for this study 
and they convert vision with CKD compared to non-CKD vision. So they have vision with normal kidney function over 1200. They convert those to vision with CKD stage two, so GFR between 60 to 90, and they have more than 500 in this group. And the third group, uh, they have vision with a CKD stage three with GFR between uh, 30 to 60. So this was very good uh, post hoc analysis and the number of patients 660 compared to 1200 compared to 500. So the lowest group, which is uh, uh, CKD stage three, still have five, more than 500 patients in it. And as you see here, here is a continuous line. This is a teriparatide. At least it's not inferior when it comes with patient with the uh, uh, lower GFR. So patient with uh, CKD stage three, they have uh, benefited from the teriparatide at least as vision with normal kidney function or has CKD stage two. Uh, I, I want just to finish. Of course, there is another potential agent that has been studied also on Boston Nobosal woman, which is uh, romosozumab, which is a monoclonal antibody to sclerostin. Uh, but the problem with this, and it, it has been very successful in decreasing the fracture rate and improving BMD. But the problem with using, uh, you know, the monoclonal antibody to sclerostin, we know that sclerostin decreases the bone formation rate because it decreases, it inhibits the wing signal. And when you inhibit the wing signal, you um, deactivate the osteoblast. You stop uh, maturate, maturation of the pre-osteoblast to a mature osteoblast, okay? And uh, this might be good because if you give antibody to the sclerostin, you improve the wing signal, then you improve the osteoblast function, then you improve the low turnover bone disease. However, sclerostin doesn't exist only in the bone, it also exists in, in the cardiovascular system. So the wing signal is present also in the cardiovascular system. And actually in the cardiovascular system, wing signal can increase differentiation of smooth muscle cells to so an osteochondrogenic cells and increase the uh, osteoblast-like cells that can form uh, protein, which we call it bone morphogenic protein, and can increase cardiovascular calcification. So there is a concern. Ferrocin antibodies, uh, uh, rosasumab hasn't been used yet in CKD, and if we're going to use it, it will be with cautious because it might increase cardiovascular calcification. Let me end up here. So this patient, we treated this patient initially for six months with um, the basic management of uh, you know low turnover bone disease it didn't improve much so we decided to give her teriparatide uh, 20 uh, units uh, sub q every day and after six months we checked the bone specific alkaline phosphorus and trap 5b and both number in, improved significantly significantly and in two years after she, she completed two years of teriparatide injection uh, she didn't have any single fracture and her BMD, the abicular bone score and bone turnover marker improved. And as you see here, um, you know, don't focus on the calcium and phosphorus. You can start focus from here, BTH improved. Uh, here is a six month uh, non, uh, you know, intervention just with the basic management. Didn't improve much, but after two years, it's 250. ARC force increased more than about two folds. That's very good. You remember the study, anything above 200 ARC force is very good. It's uh, basically can, uh, you know, rule out the adynamic bone disease. Um, also the BSAB increased more than three folds. That's very good. So this means that probably bone formation rate improved and trap 5 b also improved. We didn't do rebiopsy for this patient. We could. But because we have very good evidence that bone health improved, and here you can see we did also um, a DEXA scan, and DEXA scan improved. See the difference between before treatment, two years, see the holes, uh, the disconnectivity in the trabecular bone and the very thin cortical bone. And here you see a much better after two years. And here is the trabecular bone score improved from less than 1.2 to more than 1.4. So this means that maybe also it's not only improving the bone quantity, but also improving the bone quality. And I, I will stop by here. 
so the next time we'll discuss, is this enough? Do we need to do anything different? And other non-medical interventions, which is much more important. I hate guys because this is very expensive medicine and it's not free of side effects. And uh, we can also improve bone health by non-pharmacological interventions that we can discuss. Like, uh, exercise is very essential, you know, physical therapy, balanced diet, how can our, you know, diet affect our bone health? Stop smoking as uh, one of the, you know, at, uh, attendees mentioned in the beginning of this alcohol, we're not going to discuss this here, but anyway, you can improve and I have, I will convince you next time when we meet, um, uh, God knows when, but I will convince you that instead of just focusing on the pharmacological intervention, we can focus on something which is cheaper, uh, probably free of side effects, and it's affordable everywhere. You can use it in Egypt as well. I will end up with this slide because also of interest to see the effect of fasting Ramadan on bone health in our CKD patients and end stage kidney disease patients. And I tried to look up in the internet on PubMed if any studies has been done, so I put this, uh, you know, uh, keywords of fasting or Ramadan and dialysis or osteoporosis, so just to change the word several, several times. And you know what? Every single time I did zero publication, zero publication. Who can do this if we don't do it? We are in the Ramadan month. I really encourage you to think about it. Maybe not this Ramadan, it's already late, but next Ramadan, if you have any study preparing for any study, just to use simple thing, check biomarkers before and after Ramadan. What, what do you know about phosphate and the calcium and VTH, you know, simple thing. Uh, so you can do either non-invasive or invasive tests before and after and see exactly what happened, what is the impact of uh, fasting Ramadan. You can just have two groups of patients because not every patient fast, I know, but some at least fast. So you can check compare these people who fast with another group who, uh, you know, don't fast and compare before and after Ramadan, especially there is zero um, publication in this area instead of doing fancy stuff about glotho and uh, sclerostin and something that it's, it might be very hard to deal with. And I will stop by here and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Am. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I would like to congratulate you for the smooth landing at the end of the presentation. But I have a question before opening the, the discussion because I, I, I know that Professor Adam and Professor Saeed Khamis and all that in me may ask you some questions. So do you change your mind regarding the beta H terebratide? And if you treat the patient for how long this drug will be given? The last, in the last meeting, you mentioned that it, uh, it is to be restricted for one year. It seems that you changed my, your mind a little bit in this presentation. Please, for your no, uh, Very good. It's, it's, it's actually two years. I don't uh, remember if I said one. Yes. Okay. If I said one, it, it was wrong. No, it's, it's actually two years. And actually, the concern of uh, on, you know, osteogenic sarcoma in this patient is just proven in animals. Okay? So there is no single uh, uh, proof of this in humans. But uh, we restrict, uh, so even in Europe, they restricted uh, for uh, one and a half year. Here in America, we don't use it for more than uh, uh, two years for this concern of, uh, you know, developing osteogenic sarcoma uh, that has never been proven. But we, we, we limit ourselves here to two years, and in Europe, they limit themselves to one and a half year. So, and the, so and some the, between uh, one and two, um, but we, we, we use up to two years. One dose is enough. So it's it's yeah. I mean it's two, it's uh, it's an injection. It's sub Q. So uh, you mean daily one daily yes, dose, yes, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 But if we have this weekly, we don't have this weekly. So Mamdouf did actually a search on this, and it's only available in uh, in Japan, uh, you know, Japan planet because they are advanced and they are ahead of us. So anyway, so they have this weekly and also uh, three times a week. So you can just give it on the dialysis three times a week or uh, uh, the patient can take it weekly. It will be much better, especially for compliance and might be also cost effective. So Dr. Saeed Khamis wants to ask. Yeah. Dr. Saeed, 
السلام عليكم حسين وعليكم السلام تفضل السلام ورحمه الله Good I enjoyed you. your presentation. By the way, let me ask you a question first. Welcome, <laughs> <laughs> This is a good technique. So hydrogenic, <laughs> hydrogenic nephropathy. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was very interesting. I really like it. But uh, I wish you talked up about uh, baratheridectomy and the impact of our, you know, baratheridectomy on our vision as a part of, uh, you know, hydrogenic intervention. Uh, yes. uh, impact that, that as nephrologist and, uh, you know, baratheroid surgeon, we can induce. You know, I am. Uh, if you remember, we met in Mansoura a few right. months ago, uh, and I was uh, criticizing a lot regarding this baratheridectomy. And, uh, exactly. So I thought you were going to discuss that. Maybe because Dr. Halawa was attending. Uh, but don't forget, that Dr. <laughs> but don't forget that Dr. Halawa was there. I cannot. I could not. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, Dr. Said. He's, he's on the same page, by the way. I was talking to him this morning, and uh, yeah, we, we need to, to to discuss this in details in the future, inshallah. For sure. I May think I ask you, uh, yes. Uh, anyway, at the beginning, uh, I, I would like to uh, thank you for this panoramic and excellent uh, presentation, as usual, sir. Uh, second, you, sir. Uh, uh, regarding the, the slide, you showed this uh, uh, bone alkaline, bone specific alkaline facilities and uh, BTH, BTH more than 200 and bone specific alkaline facilities more than 20. You can rely upon as a marker of uh, a, dynamic, a dynamic bone disease or low turnover disease. If I'm planning to do research, for example, MDC or whatever, I can actually take this as a reference and I will do is a solid or what's called gold standard reference uh, that uh, the patient has uh, low, board, uh, low board turnover disease or I should do biopsy. That's my question. Sir. Thank you. Oh, okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah, uh, that's a very smart question from Dr. Said, as usual. Yes, I mean, if you have a chance of uh, doing biopsy, like like in our program, we, we do. But if you don't, I think it's it's very good. It has very good positive predictive values, especially for a dynamic bone disease. Uh, so it's you, we can utilize it as a definitely non-invasive biomarker. But if you have a chance, um, it's, 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 you know, the gold standard is a bone biopsy, definitely. And again, yeah. as you said, it's just a, a single study. But last meeting, I also I discussed other studies with, with Dr. Magdi. And also, uh, you know, the sensitivity and this is, is very good. It's not, you know, up to 100, which this is just an amazing study. And um, because 100 is the specific sensitivity is too much anyway. But anyway, um, uh, there is other, several, several other studies also proved that it's, uh, it's very useful, especially if you cannot do a bone biopsy. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Is there any questions from anyone? If, if any one of the attendees wants to ask Dr. Amr, please uh, click raise hand. Because if there's no questions, I'm going to... Dr. Meg, did you like to, to, um, to say something? something? Well, I, I would like to congratulate Dr. Amr. It's a very, very elegant presentation. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, when, uh, fortunately, we have Forteo in Egypt uh, once weekly. We don't have the one the daily. Oh, really? That's nice. Really? Is it, yes. How, yes, how much? Is it, is it 20 microgram or is it 56.5? 56. 56. We, we call it 50 here in Egypt. Because I, I oh, used okay. it for, to, to treat my mother. She had a fracture uh, just that's, at that's, the beginning that's, of this that's year. That's good. Yeah. So that's good that you, you have the weekly. We don't have here in America but, the weekly doses. But you know, the, the, the orthopedic society, they are also scared of osteosarcoma. They told me just use it right. for one year. Uh -huh. And uh, if she improves, stop it, please, because of toxicity. And actually, it has some GIT toxicity. Yeah, and, and high potential. And it is very expensive. It is very expensive drug. Yeah, I was discussing how, how, how much, you know, how, how expensive is it in Egypt? It's 4,000 per week, uh, sorry, per month. Okay, it's not bad here. <laughs> it's it's much, very bad. Much <laughs> <laughs> it's much expensive here. So uh, it's, it's a $60 uh, beer injection. So uh, in a month, uh, you know, 30 you know, by, um, you know, whatever, 60 by... 1,800 per month. <laughs> 1,800 per month. It's very expensive. Right, yes. right, right. Uh, yeah. But uh, again, the med medicine here is in general are much more expensive. Than and you. I have a comment on the last slide because yes. we told, we, we, we tell our patient to 
they should never be uh, uh, fasting uh, in dialysis. Yes. Based yes. on what evidence? Based on 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 uh, uh, so, so yes, yes, this is the actual reason. This is the best because, evidence. Uh, yes, yes. This is but, actual but, reason because maridan is nakira, nakira. So Allah. whoever is sick, he should not fast unless we allow him to fast. Especially, not the reverse. Especially when you allow him to fast. You 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 allow him to fast. You don't allow him to break fast. He should break fast unless doctors allow him to fast. But instead of you, our advisors as, as physicians, some of them is still fast, right? This is yes. another story. Would it, would it, wouldn't it be interesting to examine yes. what's going on in yes. their, you know, renal acid dystrophy parameter before and after, just in case, you know, even, yeah. even instead of, because not all are Muslim, not all, you know, believe in, in this, that uh, you don't have, even some of the very strict Muslims, you know, they, they have, there is a dogma, they cannot just, you know, break their fast. They, yes, I know. They want to fast. So anyway, so exactly. wouldn't it be interesting to just examine the impact of fasting? On um, I think fast? it's very interesting, but again, in Egypt, uh, uh, the diet in Ramadan, all of them, I, I was in the round t today in morning, all of the patients have hyperkalemia, all of them, because of the food in Ramadan. Oh. Because of the balah, the, the date? Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yes, yes. Khushaf it would be... Balach. Very good. It would be another, you know, it's a confounder. So what is the impact on potassium and other things? Yeah. I, I, I think it would be an, an interesting study. Uh, yes, and I, 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 agree. I agree. It's yeah, very agree publishable. So we, we don't and advise... It's easy, 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 and nobody else can do this except oh. us, right? We don't advise for fasting, yes. Ramadan, for the but, uh, sick patient, but uh, the idea of uh, selecting patients who are insisting to fast, I think this is a very smart idea. And I, I think very, very within very the few year. years, the, the coming few years, Ramadan will come in winter. Yes. And it will be easier right, for patients right. to fast. And we can do this test in one or two years. Next year, maybe, or the year after. Very wise. Professor yeah. Halawa, do you like to, to have any uh, comment? It seems that he is um, he, he is most likely yeah. uh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. Yes, yeah. I'm eating. scared from surgeon. Don't, mm, yeah. don't <laughs> let him ask okay. me question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so at the end of this presentation, I would like to thank you very much, Professor Am. It, it is really wonderful. Yes, sir, it's my pleasure. And the and the, uh, I, I like in your presentation that you stressed upon the basics of calcium balance, and this is to increase the depths of understanding because all of us are uh, jumping to using medications. And it, it was a very nice chance to understand the basics of the bone and how the calcium uh, behaves. Second point, you go step by step. And then, as I mentioned, a very smooth landing. So uh, thank you. It was very smart presentation and added a lot to our perspectives. And I think it will add to our practice in the future. Hoping to, hope. hoping to see Thank you to see for... and meet you again and again and again. And uh, absolutely, it's my pleasure. And uh, yes, uh, hopefully, inshallah, within a couple months, we can do ROD3. Thank we you, didn't Rob. even finish the, the low turnover. We still have to finish this low turnover, especially with the non pharmacological intervention, which, in my mind, is much more important than this expensive pharmacological intervention. Then we need to move to other. You know, the, there's another three spectrums of the bone disease and real osteodystrophy in our patients. We need to talk about. So inshallah, we'll have much more sessions in the future. Thank you very much. We are <laughs> eager. We are very eager to hear from you, uh, even even on daily <laughs> sessions. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Professor Amr, and uh, yes, hoping to meet again and again. And I would like to thank all the audience, all the professors and attendees. Thank you very much, and hoping you the best. And inshallah, tomorrow you will find this presentation uploaded to the YouTube. Thank you very much and goodbye.